Hi, and welcome to a lesson on programming output ports. Before viewing this, you should have read Chapter 2 in your textbook, up to but not including data types in C. You should have also watched the Intro to Embedded Control video and the Output Ports and Relays video. Okay, as we said last time, I.O. ports are what allow us to connect the devices to the microcontroller in order to bring information in or control something on the outside. And we said before that the PIC microcontroller includes five general purpose I.O. ports, labeled port A through port E, and most ports have multiple purposes, and as we'll see later in the course, a microcontroller has a lot of features, but you can't use all the features at the same time, so they have to be programmed for a certain thing. So, because a port can be either input or output, but not both at the same time, we have to define whether or not it's going to be input or output. So each port, up here you're looking at port A. We have a port that has 8 bits, labeled bit 0 through bit 7. Remember, we always start counting with 0 in computers. Um, and we have another register. A register is just like a memory location inside the chip. So a port is a register that actually has wires that connect to the outside world and each port has a corresponding register that's labeled TRIS and then the port name. Um, TRIS, I'll talk about what that means in a minute, but let's call this the data direction register. And what that does is it defines whether each bit of port A is going to be an input bit or an output bit. And remember that we said that ports are bit addressable, so that means that some bits can be inputs and some bits can be outputs. And the way that this TRIS register works I'll, I'll explain what TRIS is. TRIS stands for tri-state, and in digital circuits we always think of uh, an output as having two possible values, one or zero, but there's actually a third value, and that's the tri-state condition, or the high impedance. That's where it's electrically disconnected, so it doesn't do a one or a zero. Okay? I think they should have called this the data direction register, but they didn't ask me for advice when they named this. So anyways, the TRIS register defines input output for port A. TRIS A defines it for port A. So if we were talking about port B, there'd be a register here called TRIS B. Okay, you understand that? So what I do is, if I want to define ports as inputs or outputs, what I have to do is first define these bits in the TRIS register. And if I want a bit in port A to be an input bit, then I program that corresponding bit in the TRIS register with a 1. So I'm going to write a 1 here, and a 1 makes this bit an input a zero makes a bit an output. Okay, so everywhere I've got a one in a TRIS register, the corresponding pin on port on that port is an input. Everywhere I've got a zero, the corresponding pin is an output. And I always remember that a one looks kind of like the letter I for input, and a zero looks kind of like the letter O for output. Okay, now each bit in port A, port A has a name, that's port A, but we also have individual bits. Remember that the ports are bit addressable, so each bit has its own unique name, and we're going to call bit 7 of port A RA7. The R stands for register. Okay, so that's RA7, RA6, all the way down to RA0. So each one has its own unique name that is identified within the microcontroller. Okay, a microcontroller is very versatile because it can be programmed to perform different tasks. And a program is just a set of instructions that tells the microcontroller what to do. So we think of uh, the physical circuitry of a microcontroller as the hardware. The programs are known as the software. If a microcontroller were a chef, then the pots and pans and stove and utensils would be his hardware, and the recipe would be the software. The same hardware can cook up a lot of different dishes just using different recipes. Okay, so there's your hardware, there's your software, whoops, there's your software. Okay, okay, when it comes down to it, every computer is, operates in machine language, okay? Machine language is just binary ones and zeros, okay? Every computer is just digital circuits, and those ones and zeros are what control the circuits. Okay, that's the only native language of a computer, and every computer program that's running is just executing these little ones and zeros all over the place, okay? Now, don't quit the class yet, because we're not going to program in binary. Okay, be glad you weren't an electrical engineering student in the 1940s, because that's what they had to do. Um, but machine language is very cumbersome. We like to write our programs in higher level languages. They're a little bit more like English. But before these programs can run on a computer, they have to be translated. And the good thing is that we can write a computer program, or we can buy a computer program called a compiler, that translates the high level language, or the English-like language, into machine language. So we'll talk more about that later, but you should have already read about compilers in the textbook. 
Okay, here's a, a little chunk of, uh, of one computer language called C. C is a very popular programming language for microcontrollers. It's very similar to other languages like C++ and Java, which are, are used to program com personal computers, web pages, and things like that. Okay, so C is a very good language widely used in microcontrollers. So let's take a look at a fairly simple C program. Now I admit, this doesn't look all that simple. Nothing is simple, okay? Think about it this way. If it were simple, anyone could do it. And if anyone could do it, you'd make minimum wage doing it. That's not cool. So we gotta deal with a little bit of complexity. But it's not that hard to think about uh, a little chunk at a time. So we'll take a look at it a little bit at a time. Okay, let's start with the top. That first line, the pound sign, the pound sign, or the number sign, followed by the word include, um, that tells the C compiler that I want to include another file in this program. So there's a file called pick.h somewhere that somebody else wrote. That's cool. No, we didn't have to write that. Um, and what it does is it has a whole bunch of names of registers and ports and things like that. And all we need to know about this line is you're going to include that as the first line of every program you write in this class. Okay. Over here we have a set of uh, lines that are basically they're just comments. They don't mean anything to the compiler. They don't get translated into machine language or anything like that. But they tell something to the programmer. Okay, we'll talk more about comments in class. But at a minimum, you need some comments to tell, uh, um, you know, what the program does, who wrote it, when it was last updated, so that you know programs need to be maintained and people need to know who who's in charge of it. Okay, a comment begins with the slash asterisk and it ends with an asterisk slash. So everything in between here is ignored by the compiler and not translated. Okay, this line right here, um, the PIC microcontroller has uh, a lot of different features and this is turning certain ones on and off and we really don't have to worry about that because you're gonna include this line in every single program that you write, okay? Um, these two slashes here identify a comment as well, just like they do up here. When you see two slashes in a row, everything that follows it is a comment to the end of the line. Okay? This pair of symbols is used to write a multi-line comment. This one is just, you know, you want to write uh, the rest of this line is ignored. Okay? Your pro actual program starts here, right after this comment. Now, don't worry about what this means. All you need to know for now is that every program is going to have this void main with the word void in parentheses and an opening curly brace and a closing curly brace. Okay? When you write a program, just type that in immediately and then you can stick the cursor here and you start typing in your program. So every program has this. We'll talk later about what that is. But every program has a, a function or a set of functions and in this case we have at least one function called main. Okay? Don't worry about the voids. We'll talk about that later in the, in the course. Okay, now we get to our first actual command. This is the first thing that actually generates machine language and, and writes and does something to the microcontroller. Okay, this says take the tris register and this thing right here is not an equal sign. Okay, we're going to rename that. That's called the assignment operator. And what an assignment statement does is it says take what's on the right and copy it or assign it to the variable or the register on the left. So it's going to take this number and put it in here. Okay. Um, numbers in the microcontroller in the, in the C compiler is going to assume that all numbers are in decimal unless you tell it otherwise. Okay, so this 0B says this is a binary number. Okay, since we're dealing with binary, uh, we're dealing with individual bits, it's helpful to just write this out in binary. You kind of have to write it out in binary anyways. Why bother converting it? You might as well just type it in and let the, let the system figure it out. Okay. So this says take this number, this binary number, all ones, and the last one is a zero. So bit zero is going to be a zero, the other ones are going to be a one, and move it to the tris register, the tris A register. Okay, and this says send a zero to bit zero of port A, and we already know that bit zero of port A has a name, and that's RA0. Okay, so there you go. It's not that intimidating when you look at it a piece at a time. But remember that all programs are structured just like this. They all have this include statement at the top. Okay. They all have this config line. They all have a block of comments here. They all have the same exact config line, followed by a semicolon there. Okay. Um, they all have void main with the opening and closing brace, and they all have some instructions in the middle. Okay. We can also, RA0 is not a very descriptive name. 
okay uh, it's it's descriptive as far as the, the computer is concerned but I don't I don't know what's connected to RA0 and in a fairly complicated system you've got a whole bunch of devices connected to different ports you don't want to have to remember what those are so we have a way of defining custom names okay and we can do that using the define directive and what the define directive does is it says you already know this name I'm gonna call it by this name and anywhere I use this word you pretend I said this okay it just does a direct translation so if I say pound sign define furnace control relay now in your names you can't have any spaces so we're gonna cram it all together and call it furnace control relay is the same as RA0 okay I'll get to that one in a minute but define furnace control relay as being the same as RA0 so right here when it sees instead of saying RA0 is assigned the value 0 I'm gonna say furnace control relay is assigned the value on now what's on mean well I'm defining on as being 0 so this line right here does exactly what this line used to do okay but it's a lot more meaningful if I see a line that says RA0 is assigned 0 that doesn't really tell me very much if I see furnace control relay equals on that tells me hey, I'm turning the furnace on okay and the cool thing is when I do that I don't even need to write a comment on that line. This line is self-explanatory. Okay, and the structure of the define directive is pound sign define, that says I'm defining a name. This is the name that I create, and this is the name that the compiler already knows. Notice there's no equal signs in here, there's no semicolon at the end. This is the exact structure for the define directive. Okay, so there it is, C programming in a nutshell. You're ready to do your online questions and your lab prep activity, and then we'll move on to the next topic. See you later.